The date is Monday, May 31. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. A consignment of the COVID-19 vaccine manufactured by AstraZeneca arrived at the Norman Manley International Airport in Kingston, Jamaica on Sunday, May 30. This batch represents another allocation from the COVID-19 Global Access or COVAX facility. Reporter Marlon Samuels has more in this report. The campaign to vaccinate as many Jamaicans as possible was boosted with the arrival of 55,000 doses of the vaccine manufactured by AstraZeneca on Sunday, May 30. The vaccines will be used in the National Vaccination Implementation Program to inoculate persons who are due their second dose as well as other persons who are being targeted for vaccination. They include Jamaicans 50 years and older, healthcare workers, security and custom workers. Close to 155,000 Jamaicans have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. This figure represents 8% of the targeted population of close to 2 million Jamaicans. So far, over 22,000 Jamaicans have already received their second dose. The continued success of the vaccine program is one of the factors needed for the easing of restrictions. For the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. Grade 4 and Grade 5 students have until the Christmas term of the new academic year to prepare for their PEP performance tasks exams. The Ministry of Education in a release says the decision was made based on consultations with key stakeholders. Grade 5 performance task exams were initially scheduled for the third week of June and the Grade 4 exams for the last week of July. The Ministry says the new dates will be announced next term. Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination, CAPE, and Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate, CSEC, examinations will begin on June 28. The Caribbean Examinations Council, CXC, says it will consider the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on students while grading external exams. Speaking at a recent media brief, CXE Registrar and Chief Executive Officer Dr. Wayne Wesley says his team is working with the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to ensure that their candidates are not disenfranchised as a result of the volcanic eruption in that country. He says certain challenges being experienced in other countries will also be taken into consideration. The results are to be released between the last week of September and the first week of October. Recognizing the impact of the pandemic on the transport center, the government has authorized a 30% discount on licensing fee for route taxi and bus operators. Speaking in Parliament last week, Transport and Mining Minister Robert Montague explained the decision to grant the discount stems from government's directed concessions. The government recognized the cut in their income by government edict. As after we ask them to pay for and license their vehicles to carry a certain amount of passengers, then the government by order instructed that they must carry fewer passengers. It is in recognition of this that we decided to offer a 30% discount on the licensing fee for route taxi and buses. This cost the suffering taxpayer some $75 million, but we believe that it was well needed. In addition, he says, as of May 25, Transport Authority opened up the Halfway Tree Transport Center to rural stage carriage operators. This is going very well so far, and in the next phase, we will incorporate the JUTC sub-franchise holders. Madam Speaker, we can't have a lovely facility like the Halfway Tree Transport Sector and have it underutilized while our people are hustling and bustling to get a bus on the side of a road. Minister Montague also commends those in the sector who have adjusted to the times, adhering to the COVID protocols. Our operators and investors are being challenged by the stresses of today. We must salute them for the most part adhering to the COVID protocols. Our operators in the system must be given special commendation for the role they have played in treating with the pandemic. Our drivers, whether in the private or public sector, leave home, leave their families, and in order to move the economy, put themselves at risk, as they don't know who they are picking up, nor their health status. Meanwhile, the minister says a Complaints and Standards Department has been established. The 
Security Authority has also informed me that a Complaints and Standards Department has now been established that will receive complaints of unprofessional conduct and investigate these claims. Because equally, Madam Speaker, sometimes things are not as they appear, as people edit these video clips to push an agenda and wrongfully accuse our workers. Madam Speaker, the Department can be contacted at 876-383-3575 or 1-888-991-5687 or on WhatsApp at 876-551-8196. Within a few days, the Office of the Political Ombudsman will be issuing its 2020 General Election Campaign Review Report, a first in Jamaica's history. This follows what can be considered the most unusual campaign period in the country's recent past, given the COVID-19 pandemic and the first time implementation of the campaign finance legislation. Melvin Pennant has that story. The report will be launched during a virtual event on June 2nd, 2021, and will include recommendations for improvements to Jamaica's election campaign activities, particularly those related to the Office of the Political Ombudsman, OPO. The virtual event can be viewed on the OPO's Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash japoliticalombudsman. The campaign review report follows a review of the campaign through interviews with experts and other stakeholders conducted by the Office of the Political Ombudsman between October and November after the September 3 general election 2020. Findings, lessons learned and recommendations for action emerged from the robust discussions and were used to compile the findings and recommendations found in the report. It also addresses the future of the Office of the Political Ombudsman. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. On May 7, the Senate approved amendments to the standing orders to allow members to join and participate in formal sittings virtually due to the restrictions caused by the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. The standing orders are the rules that govern the proceedings, actions and conduct of members in the chamber. President of the Upper House expanded on the amendment during a recent JIS think tank session. Consequent upon us seeking advice from the Attorney General's Department, we then move to incorporate that advice into our deliberations and following that opinion which was given to us in December 2020, um, following meetings of the Standing Orders Committee of the Senate, a decision was taken using the advice of the Attorney General as a basis to, pa to allow members of the Senate to participate in meetings of the Senate virtually. He said, however, there are restrictions. The restriction, however, is that members who are attending virtually cannot form a part of the quorum, cannot vote, present bills, or motions. They are, however, entitled to all participation beyond the restrictions which I have indicated that are imposed on us by the Constitution of Jamaica. The President said that though this is an interim measure, it might be an indication of things to come. So, you could regard this development as an interim measure because we are of the view that in due course, the ideal situation would be to allow members to participate fully because it may very well be in the future that persons cannot attend Garden House for whatever reason, uh, be it a medical a pandemic or some have identified the possibility of some sort of national natural disaster that would prevent us forming a quorum at God House on Duke Street. But that is to um, something that one would look into um, in the future. As it stands now, we consider the changes that have been made to our standing orders as groundbreaking. 
Ten recipients are down to be awarded the Musgrave Medal later this year by the Institute of Jamaica. Renowned Jamaican violinist and music educator Stephen Woodham is among the recipients. Other recipients include Silver Musgrave Medal recipients, poet Professor Shara McCallum and singer Jimmy Tucker. Bronze Musgrave medals will go to author Veronica Blake Carnegie and sculptor Fitzroy Russell. Originally conceived in 1889, the Musgrave medals are awarded annually in recognition of achievement in art, science and literature. Fuel demand growth looks optimistic for the next quarter and this has firmed up global oil prices. We get this and other market details in this quick business report with Gabriel Thompson. In Friday's trading session, the JSE Combined Index advanced by 1,040 points to close at over 424,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 97 stocks of which 38 advanced, 50 declined and 9 traded firm. The Junior Market Index advanced by 33 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for Berger Paints Jamaica, CAC 2000 Limited, and Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, 1834 Investments Limited, and Access Financial Services Limited. Trading firm were CAC 2000 9.5% preference shares, Epley Limited 8.75% preference shares, and Everything Fresh Limited. Sagicor Select Funds Limited Manufacturing and Distribution was the volume leader with 107.5 million units, followed by Cygnus Credit Investments Limited USD Ordinary Shares with 4.7 million units and Sagicor Select Funds Limited Financial with 3.4 million units. In foreign exchange trading for Friday, May 28, the US dollar sold for an average $149.54. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $124.98. The pound sterling traded for $213.66 and the euro sold for an average $184.03. Oil prices firmed on Monday with Brent trading near $70 a barrel underpinned by the bright outlook for fuel demand growth in the next quarter while investors looked ahead to the OPEC Plus meeting this week to see how producers will respond. Brent crude futures rose 95 cents or 1.38 percent to $69.67 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate crude added 96 cents to $67.28 a barrel. And on that note, we close this Monday edition of the Business Report Inside the News on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Pleasant viewing. In regional news, as the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season approaches, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, SEDEMA, with support from the World Bank, today launched an initiative to improve disaster preparedness and resilience in the region. Coined Disaster Fighters, the initiative includes participation from current and former cricketers, Caribbean musical talent and other influential figures to spread critical survival messages related to hurricanes, volcanoes, COVID-19 and other hazards. Along with the communication outreach campaign, musicians and cricketers participating in the campaign will donate autographed memorabilia. This innovative fundraising system is Sidima's first foray into non-fungible tokens, a unique item that cannot be replaced by anything else. As a measure to raise support for regional disaster preparedness, this initiative is supported by the African, Caribbean, Pacific, European Union Natural Disaster Risk Reduction Program, the Canada Caribbean Resilience Facility, the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, managed by the World Bank, Binance Charity. The campaign was developed by the risk communications firm Pacifico. In Trinidad and Tobago, 60,000 citizens should be fully vaccinated by July 9th. This from Minister of Health Terence Dalsing. In a media conference on Saturday, the minister said the rollout of the second dose of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine will begin on June 7. Mahela Joseph Wharton tells us more. 
Minister of Health Terence Dial Singh said the rollout for the second dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine will be done at mass vaccination sites across the country. Why? Because we are not going to be mixing vaccines deliveries between health centers, which are currently doing Sinopharm. We don't want that to happen. So five mass vaccination sites will be dedicated solely to the administration of the second dose of AstraZeneca vaccines. He said they are hoping to vaccinate 1,000 persons per day at each site. That means we can do about 5,000 per day across all five, which means to deliver 60,000 doses All I need are 12 vaccination days. The regional health authorities will contact those who have received the first dose of the vaccine to advise of the location and date for the second dose, beginning with those who were vaccinated on Tuesday, April 6, 2021. The immunization card with a record of the first dose of the vaccine and a valid form of identification are required. Mahalia Joseph Horton, TTT News. And in St. Kitts and Nevis, the message is comply or be fined. This from Superintendent of Police as he outlined restrictive measures aimed at helping the country arrest the spread of COVID-19. The top cop says he prefers persons to comply voluntarily rather than having to impose tickets and fines, but indicated that the police and compliance officers will enforce the law. Glenn Bart reports. Persons who contravene or fail to comply with the provisions of this order shall be liable to a fine not exceeding, again, $5,000. We remind the general public that these measures are public health measures designed to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. And so we anticipate your full cooperation in the adherence to these measures. The compliance team would be working very closely with the police and would be enforcing these measures. I've been asked questions time after time about tickets. I'm pleased to announce that we now have the ticket books on hand. They have been distributed. And so effective tomorrow, persons would be liable to be ticketed for any breach of these protocols that I've just outlined. If your passenger buses carry more than 50% passenger capacity, the driver would be liable to be ticketed. If the passengers are not wearing masks on the bus, the passengers would be liable to be ticketed. If you are not practicing social distancing, if you are not practicing the sanitization uh, measures, then you will be liable also to be ticketed. The fines range is from $100 up to $500. And so we ask that persons avoid these fines. We, we have delayed the use of these tickets for quite a long time. It means that we do not want to use them. So just comply with the regulations and the protocols, and we will not have to use the tickets. The stepped-up effort on compliance to COVID-19 protocols comes as the country carries out a major contact tracing effort with the quarantining and testing of persons since the start of local community spread just about a week ago. Glenn Barth reporting for SK Newsline. Returning St. Lucia nationals who are fully vaccinated from COVID-19 and have a negative PCR test do not have to quarantine. That's the word from authorities who announced a number of major changes in their latest COVID-19 protocol advisory. In a surprise turnaround, the government of St. Lucia announced late Friday what it calls amendments to the COVID-19 protocols. The following changes take effect as of Monday, 31st May. A holder of a valid liquor license may permit a person on licensed premises to consume intoxicating liquor between the hours of 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. A competitive sporting activity may be permitted within a controlled facility with spectators on condition that persons in attendance are fully vaccinated. Competitive sporting events or activities must receive approval from the Ministry of Health. Returning nationals and visitors with a negative PCR test who are fully vaccinated will not be required to go into quarantine 
with random testing to be carried out at points of arrival. The release states that notwithstanding the adjustments, the chief medical officer retains the power to place visitors in quarantine in order to protect public health. Social events with up to 50 fully vaccinated people may be permitted after authorization from the Ministry of Health. The changes take effect from the 31st of May to the 30th of June 2021. The changes come against the backdrop of sustained calls in the media for adjustments to the protocols, particularly as it pertains to fully vaccinated individuals and the requirement for long periods of quarantine. The government of St. Lucia advises that all public health measures such as mandatory mask wearing in public, social distancing and the washing and sanitizing of hands remain in place and that the curfew continues to be in effect from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. Stanley Lucien for the HDS News Force. In sports, Jamaican athlete Martin Manley has announced his retirement from the sport at age 24. Manley won the Youth Olympic 400 meters title in 2013 and in 2014 won the world under 18 crown in 2014. In his post on Instagram, Manley said, quote, I say this with heavy heart. I'm retiring from a track and field. This decision was very tough, and although I know this will not bring me happiness, I believe it is the right action to take at this time in my life. End quote. He said persistent injuries played a major role in his decision. Manley turned 24 years old in March 2021. And that's our package. Thanks so much for watching PBCJ, the People's Station.